today. We'll get started in just a moment. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jesse Wheeland. I'm the Associate Director at the Office of National Fellowships. Um, we have a few other people from our team joining today. I'll let them take a moment and introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Bonnie Garcia Glockner. I'm the Assistant Director for ONF. And my name is Christine Perry. I'm the Graduate Assistant here in ONF. Uh, and we have the distinct pleasure of having Jesse Marks join us today uh, to be able to talk a little bit about his uh, time as a Florida State student and since specifically through the uh, Fulbright U.S. Student Program. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Jesse and then uh, we'll get started with a few questions and then, of course, have plenty of time uh, to turn it over to all of you to be able to ask questions uh, from Jesse about uh, all of his experiences abroad uh, and hopefully get some really exciting insight uh, now that all of you uh, have have met the campus deadline or maybe are planning to apply to Fulbright in the yeah, near future. Um, uh, but make sure that you get the opportunity to ask Jesse some questions. Um, and so to start, uh, Jesse Marks is a foreign affairs and uh, policy expert uh, with extensive experience in foreign policy, peace and conflict studies, humanitarian responses, uh, and China, uh, China Middle East uh, relations. Uh, he currently is an Associate Director for the Middle East and China with Edelman Global Advisory. He previously served as an advisor for Middle East policy in the Office of the Sec uh, Secretary of Defense. Uh, Jesse has spent five years in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East as a Boring Scholar, Fulbright Fellow at the Jordan Center for Strategic Studies, uh, Scoville Fellow at the Stimson Center's Protecting Civilians in Conflict, and a Schwartzman Scholar at Tsinghua University in Beijing. His work is published with Washington Post, Carnegie Mellon East, Foreign Affairs, Atlantic Council, Middle East Institute, and more. He holds a master's degree in global affairs from Tsinghua University, Beijing, a master's in philosophy in international relations and politics uh, from the University of Cambridge, and a BA in Middle East studies and, uh, from Florida State University. Uh, and an AA from uh, Florida Community College of Jacksonville. Uh, so, Jesse, welcome. Um, and figured we could get things uh, started by uh, sharing with the group a little bit more about what you are currently doing in your career. Uh, and how did the Fulbright Fellowship play into that trajectory? Excellent. Thank you so much, Jesse, for having me. Always great to have a Jesse, Jesse Power Hour. I, I like making that joke because it's fun. Um, it's really great and an honor to be back with you all. And I'm really excited to kind of get to talk with you guys about Fulbright. Um, so currently in my, I guess, career path, um, COVID always tends to set us in and I guess sent a lot of us in ways we didn't expect. Um, for me, um, I was uh, in Beijing doing a second graduate degree um, when we got told we had to leave. Um, so my kind of desired career of spending time in Asia and working on China Middle East relations was upset. Um, and, you know, as often happens, and probably as many folks on this call um, can remember where they were at when they heard about the lockdown, um, had to flee across a couple of countries and ended up back in the U.S., um, but it ended up being a unique opportunity um, because of my time on Fulbright and because of my time in programs like Boren, um, I knew that I had wanted to pursue a career in kind of the intersection of international affairs, public policy and humanitarianism. Um, and then over time, this, you know, kind of interest in China grew and I'll, I'll touch on that process. But um, in my career, I guess currently, um, I work uh, as an advisor to a number of clients, both governments, um, as well as companies on a number of issues that emerge, everything from climate to geopolitical developments around the world. Um, it's a unique opportunity. Um, you really get to see the whole range um, of all the exciting and often depressing things that happen in the world and that are happening currently um, in terms of touching things like Ukraine and understanding the impacts of, of say, uh, an invasion on how companies think about things like staffing and providing services or helping people get out, those types of questions. Um, 
but at the same time, um, I, I kind of work in my free time as a non-resident fellow at the Stimson Center, which is a nonpartisan think tank um, that covers a range of functional issues from, uh, you know, regional like China, East Asia, South Asia, to issues like uh, arms control, protecting civilians in conflict. Um, and soon I'll be transitioning out of my current role and kind of moving back into a policy focused field where I'll be kind of more heavily focusing on research and policy around uh, U.S. and China competition in the Middle East, particularly around the question of um, within U.S. China competition, how do you address key areas of cooperation, such as ending war, uh, providing humanitarian aid, development, those types of questions. Um, for me, Fulbright was a really interesting hinge point. Um, I initially applied in 2000 and 16 for the 2017-2018 round in Jordan. As a researcher, my proposal had been predicated on uh, about three or four years in the Middle East working on the Syrian refugee crisis through uh, both time at FSU, looking at research, um, particularly around the question of what happens when the war ends and refugees who have been displaced in neighboring countries go home. Um, there were a lot of components of that. Um, when I was on born in 2015-16, I had the distinct privilege and opportunity to work at the UN Refugee Agency, where the big question of repatriation, what happens when refugees choose to go back, um, was, was a major gap. You know, it was, it was just becoming um, a, a topic of conversation. You know, we were three or four years in the war. People had hoped it would end. Here we are, you know, 12 years later and the war is still going on. Um, but as I transitioned out of those years, graduated from FSU, I was really keen to kind of focus on this specific policy area and this policy issue. Um, a number of the Syrians I had met during my time um, in Jordan and just having done research on this for a long time, it was very near, near and dear to my heart. Um, and you know, there was a desire to actually help see some kind of sustainable and durable solution for their displacement come to an end and facilitate, if at all possible, um, you know, a safe return. Um, in many cases, that that was not re real. Um, you know that that solution, that durable option, has not yet been laid on the table, given that there's still conflict in the country. Um, but Fulbright really gave me a chance to dig into that question um, for a year in 2017 and 2018. It opened up the door for a lot of other avenues of, of research that I did not expect. Uh, the most interesting one was, you know, when asking the question, you know, how do you help? Um, refugees return home in a post-conflict environment safely and sustainably, there's this question of, well, who's going to rebuild a country that's been at war that actually creates the conditions that are safe for people to go back? Um, and it led to this inevitable question of China. Um, so the latter part of my Fulbright, probably six months, I spent studying Mandarin on top of Arabic with try trying to get like some kind of cohesive semblance of what China was, China's history, China's background, and I had very little basis for understanding it. Um, and it ultimately inspired me to pursue a, a second graduate degree in Beijing um, a couple of years later. Um, so Fulbright realistically was a, a very powerful hinge point where like my research, which had been relatively narrowly focused on humanitarian access and to the war in Syria and helping people um, find long-term durable solutions shifted quite, quite, or I guess you could say even opened up to actually look at other parts of that equation and parts of that question as they relate to China specifically. Seeing that uh, most people in attendance right now have, have just completed the application process, can you talk a little bit about how, like what, what the process of applying to Fulbright was like? How did you take all of these varying interests that you had and you know try to fit it into, I think you had, what, three, uh, three pages total for the academic grant? Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. I think um, as many of you all probably uh, can attest to, this is like deeply emotionally I guess, rigorous, challenging, and weirdly therapeutic process where you have to like look at your life and try to think about yourself um, in, a, in a future context, right? And try to try to picture yourself in the role of a Fulbright Scholar, whether that's for ETA and research, and try to explain to a committee why they should pick you. Um, learning to write about yourself, at least about myself and, and my accomplishments to date, um, was challenging. Yeah, there was so much anxiety. Um, but at an equal degree of excitement. Um, I don't really know how to put it into words, but there's just like this paradox of emotions, um, you know, this like deep sense of passion blended with massive amounts of imposter syndrome. Um, and I mean, overcoming those, weirdly the essay writing process was, it was a key part of, um, I'm someone who processes on paper. So being able to lay out a, you know, we have three pages to write all this, being able to write like a six page draft the first round and having owned up be like, this is really great, way too long, but we can work and start to cut this down um, was really helpful, right? Having that ear 
um, with um, the team over there to be able to talk to, to be able to even make sense of certain experiences in my own life that I might not have even come to, um, which is where I say it's therapeutic, right? Connections I didn't make initially about, you know, why do I care about refugees? Well, there was actually this experience when I was younger that kind of created this sense of, I guess, familiarity to um, this desire to help vulnerable communities while at the same time, I guess, kind of working on a part of myself that I needed to. Um, so I, there's this kind of like, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's for people who've gone through it, and many of you have, I think there, there might be a sense of um, camaraderie there where you're learning a lot about yourself. Um, in terms of structuring it technically, the process um, was very much the one that was learned. Um, having access to ONF for me was very helpful because I didn't have to go do all of the initial research myself. You know, there were folks who had understood what a winning essay looked like. Um, and not necessarily like a cut and paste winning essay, but like what the general building blocks of it are and how to apply those building blocks to your specific story so that your story can be crafted in a way that is impactful. Um, and I know a number of you have just submitted those. Um, so you are familiar with that process. Um, the other side of it was, I think, probably often the hardest is the imposter syndrome component. So much of this is trying to, I, it, a lot of this is just a conversation with yourself. Um, you know, some people don't have any issues with it. For me, it was it was a little strange trying to like sell myself to someone who you know, the U.S. government should spend money on to go abroad and to answer these questions and do this research. Um, and uh, I remember um, it was Dr. Fryer who told me in one of our meetings, like sometimes you have to take a step back, look at yourself as objectively as possible, knowing right. So like put your essays away for a week, come back to them and read them as if they were someone else and try to like make sense of them. I remember one time I went through and I changed all of the personal pronouns to third person just to like try to like take myself out of it, to understand and like work through that process of like, okay, I have done these things. This is something that I am qualified for. This is something that I'm in some cases worthy of and I want to pursue and there's nothing wrong with that. And it is okay that I'm doing that. Um, so it was a unique process that forced me to stretch the way that I thought about myself stretch the way that I talked about myself um, you know you approach it with a significant amount of humility but also a significant amount of drive and passion and somehow through those two things the application came out um, I wish I had something more structural but um, it, it's I know it, it's just like very unique process um, and now that you're getting ready to gear up for the campus level interview um, I think there's more technical skills that you can begin to build here I'm not sure if that was a question that you had coming up Jesse but I can move into that if you'd like yeah, um, I and we can circle back to some of the questions I have about the application process itself. But yes, all, all the students now have about like one and a half to two weeks uh, to to prepare for their interviews. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about that process, both at the campus level? Um, but then did you also have an interview when you were nominated as a semifinalist? And then talk a little bit more about that process, if so. Certainly, I can work backwards. Um, I did not have an interview process. Um, Jordan, in terms of research, uh, was pretty much they because they had such a history of like selection. They generally had a pretty good idea at the um, kind of commission level in Jordan um, that they were pretty consistent. So they picked by application. There was, um, I know, in some years there was occasionally follow up if someone had a question, but it was typically largely around. Um, feasibility of a project, right? If something was too politically sensitive or something, you know, they might come back and say, hey, we really like your application, but, you know, maybe tweak this or something. So the feasibility component plays into that. Um, but I mean, on the, on the campus side, right? I think there are actually some very tangible things you can do to prepare in the next two weeks. Um, first and foremost, whether you're ETA or re your research, you're picking a country for a reason. I would do a little bit of like three to five articles. They can be academic, they could be political, they could be cultural, they could be historic, right? To get to know your country and familiarity if you don't have a background in it. I think that's a big one is to make sure that you know generally the context that you're walking into. You don't have to be an expert on it. You don't, you don't have to fake being an expert on it, right? Part of the process of Fulbright is exploration. Um, but it's helpful to know, particularly as you're talking to the committee who are going to be giving you feedback and asking you questions about your proposal that you know they know that you have an understanding of the environment around you, particularly, for example, if your research is, say, linked to geopolitical or economic conditions, knowing whether the economy is doing well or not, or knowing how it's been impacted by the Ukraine crisis, or what other geopolitical factors are around it. If it's STEM, knowing 
kind of what is the situation around your specific topic um, if you're doing research. Um, I had a friend who was doing water security and did a significant amount around in Jordan who did like geopolitics of water security and like looked at the major issues that have been prominent in the last five months. Um, and if you're doing ETA, you know, kind of look at the environment of like, what are the areas that you want to engage in while you're there? I think those things are quite helpful. Um, the second one is talk to professors. Um, FSU has some of the smartest people I've ever met. And most often you could probably set up half an hour their, their office hours, just shoot them an email. Um, I did that, Dr. Peter Gerritsen was uh, like a godsend for me throughout my um, kind of fellowship applications and in, even beyond we developed a very close uh, friendship. Um, and so I think that will really help kind of give you feedback on how you craft your research narrative um, and, and kind of talk about the justification of why you picked the country and why the project that you did. And I think the third one's probably more um, reflective, but it's like thinking deeply about who you are, who you want to be and how Fulbright bridges that gap, right? Um, for me, as an example, I was someone who had a deep love and passion and wanted to work in the Middle East and work on humanitarian issues in Syria. But the significant gap that I had is I a, didn't really know what that looked like in practice. I didn't have much policy experience. Um, I had mostly been a researcher and an analyst, but I wanted to be able to bridge that gap. Um, so when I actually applied and kind of put my craft in my Fulbright, I said that I was going to use the next six to eight months that I had before Fulbright would have happened to um, try to write and publish one paper and think about the policy connection to it. Because eventually I wanted to work in government. I wanted to work on these policy issues and blend kind of the field that I, the, the research I'd done in Jordan on these, these, these issues into a kind of more cohesive policy structure to be able to inform uh, congressional members who are making decisions, um, the federal government, the different agencies that were working on some of these issues. Um, so for me, kind of that six month was kind of Fulbright for me was able to bridge those gaps and I was able to use that period and then build up to Fulbright and then during Fulbright to actually um, engage more as a policymaker, not just a researcher and analyst. Um, so I think really thinking deeply about those two points, the beginning and the end and how you fill the middle to ensure even in a narrative style that you are going from here to here. And I think that will be very helpful. And now uh, for those people in attendance who haven't yet submitted a Fulbright application, um, but might be interested in doing so, um, can you talk a little bit about like when in the formulation of your project, like how did you ultimately, was it obvious that you were going to apply to Jordan from the get go or, or how did you come to that? understanding, uh, but then even within Jordan, um, how did you how did you know that it was the Jordan Center for Strategic Studies, you know, that you wanted to partner with? Like, because that's another issue that some students have is like, they may know the area, but then they have so many different options for where they could ultimately work. Um, can you talk a little bit about that process? Absolutely. So, I mean, starting with the former in terms of deciding on Jordan, um, I visited Jordan when I was in high school, and I kind of fell in love with the Middle East from a relatively young age. So, um, for me, the concept of I knew I wanted to work in a region, um, but I've been encouraged um, to, you know, explore other areas after I'd spent so much time in Jordan. Um, I had the privilege of doing a born there as well, so I kind of knew the landscape. So because of my time on born, I had actually done an internship with the Center for Strategic Studies. I had about two or three months. Um, so I looked at other institutions and, you know, maybe it would be easier to go somewhere else. But at the end of the day, the, familiar, the familiarity and the access that the institution had. Um, and kind of the general experience I had there as an internship would make the transition to do the research there quite easy. Um, even if I didn't um, know CSS at the time, um, I always tend to, in these types of situations, reach out and just say, hey, this is who I am. I'm applying for this, this grant. Um, this is my research. This is something that you'd be interested in, you know, and find a point person who seems of interest to you you know, that you could connect to and be like, you know, I'm, I'm looking at developing this proposal. I would love to chat with you and see if there's kind of any synergy between you and say the research or the institution. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, if you're spending a year in a place, like it'd be good to like have a relationship with um, an institution so that, you know, when you have stressful days with research or, you know, the schools that you're potentially teaching, I think ETA is a little bit different. Um, having a place to go, it's kind of like home base is always really helpful. Um, sometimes those institutions can be a little bit challenging when you're in country, you know, it's a different situation, it's a different culture, it's a different environment, research um, kind of priorities change. Um, so it, it's it's good to kind of have that relationship in advance. Um, so would never be fearful. I, I would encourage you, in fact, to like reach out to a place, you know, say you want to study um, ancient cairns, like archaeological burial grounds in Kazakhstan. 
right? Find an institution that has written or done something remotely related to archaeology in Kazakhstan and just shoot them an email. Like, hey, this is my background. This is who I am, and I'm applying for this. Do you have any interest, or would you be willing to sit down and have a conversation, or would you be willing to consider sponsoring me? And um, if they say yes, then like even better, call them up and be like, hey, um, you know, I'm getting ready to submit this application. Thanks for talking to me, and then follow up with an email. Um, and, and see if they'd be willing to write you a letter of uh, sponsorship. That, that helps quite a lot in this process. And if they say yes, then be willing to write the letter for them about, you know, basically your program. And so it's easy for them. All they have to do is sign it. Um, that was how my process went from start to finish. It took, you know, it took time, right? We had to set up meetings. We had to have conversations. We had to find the points of uh, mutual interest. You know, I needed to understand the sensitivities around some of the questions that I had with them. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a discussion on many levels. It's an ongoing conversation. But when we reached the point where like, okay, this could work. Um, they were really easy and really happy to sign a, a letter and I made it easy for them and <laughs> drafted it for them and they kind of reviewed it, edited it, sent it over on a letterhead and voila, it worked out. Um, so always do your research in advance and find that potential partner. I think it helps enhance your application drastically. And on the second part that you had asked in terms of, um, uh, sorry, I think my brain is spacing. Could you remind me on the second part? Um. Yeah, and how did you settle on these specific institutes? Yes. Um, appreciate that, sorry. Uh, so I looked for um, a couple of things. One, um, familiarity with my specific area of expertise. Um, so CSS uh, it ended up, I, because of when I was actually looking at, at institutions initially, even when I was on board to do an internship with, they were top rated on the like global think tank um, index. So I like started looking up their work in Arabic, saw a number of things on refugees. I was like, okay, interesting. And it was like a Jordanian perspective because Jordan's a huge host population for, you know, anywhere from like 700,000 to 1.25 million refugees. So they had a lot to say and there was a lot of really interesting opinions. So it was, it was unique to see how they thought about it. And when I was um, kind of vetting other institutions, they seemed to be the ones that had kind of the most infrastructure around the topic. Um, and they actually had people who could serve as potential advisors. So I reached out and found a potential advisor as well. Um, and that advisor had experience in, in, in that specific area of policy. So it kind of made sense when we had a conversation. They we were like, oh, yeah, we've done work on this. You know, it'd be really interesting to have your perspective. Let's sit down and plan it through. Um, so see, there was most synergy with CSS. Um, and then when I actually got to the institution, right, then I was actually able to, when in Jordan, I could actually see on ground how many people were working on this issue set. And it allowed for a lot of other avenues for conversations, cooperation with different institutions. I got to co-write a couple of papers with actually another Fulbright, um, but not one of the research fellows, one of the research scholars who was, she was um, like quite high up in her academic career and I got to learn a lot with her. Um, she ended up serving kind of as a quasi de facto advisor as well. Um, it was just a really unique opportunity. So um, it, it really comes down to researching um, both institutions in your country, as well as areas that have a lot of synergy with both you personally your personality type, the type of research, the institutions they provide, and a big one, do they have a desk that you can sit at and actually do work? I think that's always one that people tend to not think about. But Yeah, I think that's a great piece of advice. It's never too early to start reaching out, even if it's sending cold emails, uh, because oftentimes year in and year out, it's the affiliate, uh, the affiliation component of the application that often gives students the most trouble uh, and, and putting that together. Um, and so use your resources, use your faculty, use the people that are there to support you, but you'd be surprised at uh, how receptive some institutions and some faculty are to just receiving a cold email from a student that's just really interested in getting involved. Um, but I do have another question, but I, I also wanna make sure that I leave I leave time for everyone else to, uh, to ask questions as well. Um, and so I know you've spoken about your boring experience in Jordan. Do you, was that the most, uh, important experience prior to participating in Fulbright, or what? What do you feel like most prepared you for your time abroad through the Fulbright program? Um, so even prior to Boren, um, FSU generally the international, all the international components of my time at FSU. You know, Center for Intensive English. I used to teach and help tutor in English, so I was constantly engaging with the international student community. Um, which gave me a chance to practice Arabic a lot, right? So that actually improved my um, kind of score before I applied for Born and Fulbright so that I ranked at a higher level so that when I actually went on those programs, I could test in at a higher level, which meant that I could actually improve my Arabic over the longer run and kind of leave um, at, a, at a higher level closer to what I wanted to be at in order to do my research. Um, 
professors. Honestly, those, those were the Dr. Peter Gerritsen, um, who was leading the Middle East studies, Dr. Zainish Slinoff, um, who runs the Arabic program, like having them and having access to them as they encouraged me day in and day out to, you know, pursue some of these things, even in times where I didn't think I was competitive or, you know, that like voice gets in your head and you deal with the imposter syndrome component who kind of coached me through and they're like, come on, you got to do this. Like there's this built for you to go pursue your opportunities. Like if you choose not to, you're only letting yourself down. Um, so honestly, those relationships at FSU and I can't even begin to talk to the role that Dr. Spiler played and just daily encouragement, weekly encouragement, um, all of the interactions with ONF and the offices, um, the, the folks that were there across the board, I mean, were incredibly, incredibly supportive. Um, then moving into kind of my first fellowship, like it was really, I remember the day that I found that I won born, I was just like, wait, what? Like the government's giving me $20,000 to go study Arabic in the middle of like, what? And it kind of, it, it hits you like, a, like an iron kettle against the head. It was just like, whoa, okay. I'm doing this, we're doing this. And I finished and I was just like, I wanna do this again. Like this was the most rewarding experience. I worked for the UN, I got to work tangibly in a lot of these areas I'd been studying. Even as an undergrad, I got to do these things. Um, and then Fulbright was like this unique one because where Bourne was largely language study and I did get to do some cool work and get some kind of cool work experiences during it. Fulbright was like, okay, I, I'm someone who's passionate about research and I had kind of really dove into these issues head first while I was on Bourne. Fulbright well, was like, we're just going to pay you, I think it was like 30, something around there. And they're like, we're just going to pay you for a year to go study this stuff and bring your expertise back in the federal government. And the year that I started, I believe it was President Obama had put in right at the end of 2016, basically non-competitive eligibility, this concept basically where you can, if you're a Fulbrighter, you have one year after you finish your Fulbright, where you can actually enter the government with a specific hiring authority that makes it easier for them to hire you. Um, and as that was new at the time, so it was harder to kind of implement, but it, now it's become increasingly more popular. State Department has these like events where former borns and Fulbrighters and different people who've gone through these programs, you know, come in and talk to other alumni who are currently in those positions and they're, they're beginning to pull people in. So there's like a lot of really interesting gateways and access points into some cool roles of state and DOD and different places that come from these. So um, yeah, Boren helped prepare me, but Fulbright was really that opportunity where I felt I was like, it's kind of sink or swim in a lot of ways. I don't think it was ever really sink or swim because Jordan has a pretty robust um, Fulbright commission and kind of core staff and country who helped on a lot of issues. If there were ever kind of cultural things that I needed to know, even housing um, a couple of times, you know, they, they were just some of the greatest staff. And honestly, the Fulbright director for Jordan at the time, Elon McNara was like an uncle to all of us. He, they just went out of their way even when they didn't have to, to make the experience just a deep and enjoyable process um facilitated all of the like crazy mechanic like mechanics of like getting a not even the visa but like getting residency and all the hard parts about that it was like very easy and it was fantastic um so i think both of them played an important role i um, born mostly in kind of helping me i think more more personally understand that i actually could compete for these things um and then Fulbright actually kind of not even just I can compete, but like I can actually produce, I can actually like I, I felt that was the first year that I think I saw myself as a serious scholar, that I saw myself as someone that could actually build a career doing this, doing research, doing policy um, and kind of building a career on something I was passionate about. I often didn't think that was possible. So. Thank you for sharing that. Um... I have a few more questions, but um, I can hold those until the end. Um, I would love for any of our participants uh, uh, to be able to uh, feel free to type into the chat and Christine can read those questions out or if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your questions. But um, Jesse would love to answer anything about uh, his time during his Fulbright experience or after. Um, and so please feel free to ask any questions that you have. I have a question about the integration and then reintegration once you are finished with your Fulbright. Um, I have found my way down the rabbit hole of Fulbright YouTube because I don't have a TikTok. And um, that is something that comes up in quite a bit of videos where um, if you are in this new space, I would personally be doing an ETA, um, integrating within the community aside from your Fulbright responsibilities and then what that looks like once you return back to the US. If you could speak to those two things. Definitely. Um, walking into and depending on where you go, right? Some people go to cultures that they're incredibly familiar with. 
Um, we even have like first generation, second generation Arabs who are going to Jordan. They spoke Arabic quite fluently, right? It's, it's a different, it's a different trap. So I can only speak to like the concept of being like a white dude going to the Middle East. Um, but each one has kind of their own specific component. Um, for me, it was, it was different. Um, again, I had the benefit of having been there. So I can actually speak a little bit to my born experience going there for the first time for a full year. Um, just, it, it was, it was like walking into a maze, like a familiar maze. Um, because I had studied it, <laughs> there was a, a deep sense of humility that was just like, wow, not everything I studied actually applies in this context. Um, and um, I just had to take everything with uh, an extended breath. Things would be long, stressful, annoying, but at the same time, and those moments where I was sitting in an office for like, I don't know, two hours waiting on something. I would get to talk to random people and practice my Arabic and hear about their lives and even their struggles. And, you know, it's, it's kind of, I guess for me, it was so much of it was trying to switch my focus and actually try to understand and, and just get to know people in their day-to-day -day lives um, rather than seeing the reason for what I studied or what I read or what I thought I understood really just kind of shutting up and learning from people around me. Um, that I think was the big thing that helped me push through the more frustrating moments um and you know you also have like at the end of your first month or first or second month you have like the honeymoon period kind of ends and you kind of get to this period where there's a level of frustration as you start missing home or even just you start missing kind of um the american sense of modernity this idea that like you know infrastructure water that like comes out whenever you press it not having to worry whether you're going to run out of water um is those types of things they just come with it but by the time at least that i hit like month three or four life was like really normal and, you know, you kind of laugh like, oh, we ran out of water on Thursday. It looks like it's coming on Friday. So whoop, no shower tonight. Like you, you just those and, you know, your neighbors, you get to know them. You know, at first you like particularly going, I was not used to the call to prayer at 4 a.m. Um, so that was like very different. And, and then eventually by like month, by the end of month one, I get to sleep through it. Um, and now whenever I'm in the region, I was in Turkey in July, I heard the Muslim in the morning and I was just like, oh, my gosh, I miss this so much. Um, so there's like that sense of familiarity with life. It, you just, you, you, you begin to run with it, right? You begin to live day to day. Um, and then coming back, I think was probably a little bit harder. Saying goodbye was probably the hardest part, uh, because I had really grown attached to the region, particularly, um, I've been going to Jordan for going on 12 years now. Um, and my friends I met in 2010 and 2011 are my closest friends still. Like I, I see them, I'm getting ready to go back in a few weeks to see them um so leaving was kind of like leaving home it was like leaving people that i'd come to know and, and identify as like family um but at the same time right reintegrating into the u.s was different the types of things that i prioritized here in day-to-day -day life had changed um the types of things that i'd come to appreciate about the world had also changed um certain things seemed juvenile while other things seemed very important um i think i had a much greater sense of patience um, at some level, um, I think there was also a level of frustration. I think this is something that's been shared by several people I know, um, right? The people are just a little bit more irritable because it's like, why, why am I like living in this? Like, you just get used to like living in a simpler life in a more quiet environment, or in some cases, just like life can be a lot more hectic in another country, but at the same time, it's just like a different kind of hectic. Um, it's not entirely about work. It's not about working crazy hours and making money. Family is prioritized more, like all of these things. Um, it just took time for to adapt when coming back. I don't know if that's helpful. Like I can talk about this because there are so many different pieces and I'm happy to like connect on the side if those are, you have specific like, questions or concerns on that front. Other questions? Jesse, I do have another one. Um, Go for it. We don't. We don't need to. I think get into all of, all of the nuances on uh, America's image on the world stage after the past uh, few years. But um, something that gets brought up a lot, not just with Fulbright, but with a lot of our other international fellowships, is the role of citizen diplomacy, as it's sometimes framed, or you know, being this representative of the United States, and for better or worse, being representative of things we may or may not agree with. Um, can you speak a little bit to, I'm um, both at the time that you went, but any advice for students now that may be 
uh, you know, applying to or, or soon to leave, you know, on these types of fellowships and entering into a part of the world where maybe uh, the American perception isn't as bright or as positive as it used to be? Certainly. Um, I, speaking to the context of where I was in, in Jordan, um, my favorite interactions with folks around politics, I mean, at least in, in Jordan, it's pretty anglophonic. The country, they have a long-standing relationship with the U.S. going back decades they're used to having Americans around. Um, so typically they're pretty receptive when you tell them you're American, like I'm American, like they're, they're very lovely about it. Um, when you get into topics of politics, particularly as you start to learn a language, um, you know, if you talk simply about it, they'll typically create an, an early distinction where they'll be like, oh yeah, we love Americans, we can't stand in your government. Like that, that, that happens a lot. Um, and in those environments, if you choose to continue talking, you, you get some really interesting conversations, right? Jordan is overwhelmingly, there's a huge Palestinian population, many of whom were refugees after the Israeli-Palestinian War in 1948. So there's a lot of, you know, linkages there that come to play in society that are quite powerful. Um, so, you know, you have interesting conversations about the U.S.'s position toward the Middle East, the war in Iraq. There are a lot of Iraqi refugees who settled in Jordan over time. So a lot of these conversations, as you learn the language, are inescapable, particularly as when you're in language classes. Right. These types of things get raised um, just in general, because part of like learning the language and spending time, like if you do the CLIA grant through Fulbright, um, you can't, which is the, basically a language. They give you about three months of funding at the beginning to study uh, the language. And then you basically start your Fulbright uh, research grant at kind of the end of that three months. Um, so it's kind of an extended Fulbright. It's kind of cool. It's like an additional money and free language classes apply for it. Um, it. You know, we would get into these topics in class and, and we would have such diverse opinions and views across the board um and depending on how the class is structured you really get sometimes pushed in a corner and and you know no one's asking you to defend america on that front right america is a huge place with massive diversity and ways of approaching the world across the board far right far left everywhere in between um and those opinions are all represented across your cohort that are probably going to be with you um, I would probably say most of them tend to fall to the center left, but, um, you know, to that side of things, but, you know, they're all there and America is a diverse place and these opinions exist. So you have to contend with them. Um, and it's quite, it's quite fun when, you know, you have folks on the American side who both, you know, maybe disagree on a policy issue in an environment where there's, you know, a number of, of nationals from say Jordan who are there because then they can actually see the diversity that exists in America as well. Right. That there are these differing opinions, competing thoughts about policy. Um, so I, yeah, I would never be afraid of being and identifying as an American. Um, I would always, if you have a view about something, right, state it, state it respectfully in the context of knowing where you're at. You know, if you're going to different places, there might be varying degrees of sensitivity. So always be sensitive to those environments. But I mean, you are who you are. You, you view the world the way that you view the world. So I, to the extent that you're able and willing and want to talk about it, people are going to be willing to listen. And in my experience, um, the, the interactions I've had with people are much more willing to listen and to hear. And, and, and likewise, you listen and you hear their opinion. Um, they're very they're very good at bifurcating any frustrations they have with American foreign policy or more of the image of America with um, you know who you are and your opinion. Um, and I think that's a really important piece. One of my favorite anecdotal stories is I learned what Florida man was. And I'm not kidding, maybe this is just showing my age, but I learned what Florida man was from my Arabic professor at, at the center I was at in Jordan. She, she asked me, she's like, so what is this hashtag Florida man? You're from Florida, right? I'm like, yeah. She, I was like, I have no idea. And she's like, look, look it up, Florida man challenge. I was like, I spent an hour going down a rabbit hole, Florida man challenge. Like it, it just, it was really funny how much she knew about American social media that I did not know. Um, so I think that was like very helpful. Um, and then in terms of, yeah, I think that covered both sides of the question. I really can't find way. I, I'm just ready to find a way to insert Florida man questions into any fellowship applicant that we have from Florida State University moving forward uh, <laughs> and how you would defend yourself. Uh, but no, I really appreciate your perspective on that topic. Other questions for Jesse, because I can continue talking uh, as my colleagues can can well attest. Um, and so I have plenty more questions, but I want to make sure I leave the floor open for everyone else. Hi, Jesse, I have a question. Hey, Miguel, go ahead. What, is the hard, what was the hardest question uh, from the Fulbright Committee during your interview, if you remember? Ooh. 
Hmm. It was on research methods. Um, like what I was, I had proposed to do a, a survey um, of refugee intentions for return to Syria. Um, and the question was really around ethics and um, how I designed kind of how a, had I thought through how I would survey in a sensitive environment, right? Where Syrians in many cases were refugees in Jordan and there was sensitivity around, okay, how they were seen and perceived by the local community. So um, yeah, it was the question of if I remember correctly, it was around like how I had factored in um, kind of these political sensitivities and ensured that I was going to do my research in an ethical manner. Um, and, you know, there were follow-up questions on that. Um, I remember my response was, I didn't actually know how I was going to design the survey. Um, you know, that was not something I had gotten that far in the actual research proposal. But my, um, the, the ways that I had kind of prepared generally for that is the research institution that I was working with historically um, is one of the big polling centers in Jordan. So they have experience with that. Um, in terms of the ethical side, that was something that I followed up with one of the professors who had kind of asked a question in that vein and offered willingness to kind of work with them and to, you know, potentially use them as an advisor in this process to make sure that my research design ensured that I was, you know, causing no harm in the areas I was going and the work that I was doing. Um, so, you know, if, if it's, if you get a question like that, you don't have an answer or you haven't gotten that far, um, follow up there, or you can literally state, you know, I'm still working through some of those questions, you know, it's just been one of the challenges, but this is something I would actually like to work with you on if you are willing or have time. Um, and I, I think a lot of people, particularly because most most folks here, are there, if not all, are going to be rooting for you to succeed in these things, um, uh, would be willing to help on that. Thank you so much for that amazing answer. Of course. Any others? I'll ask, um, what was the most difficult thing to navigate during your Fulbright stay and then how did you navigate through it? Ooh, um, to be blunt, um, host affiliation continuity. Um, it is differing understandings of academia. There are different understandings of what hierarchy look like. Um, you know, so you could have a research advisor on the ground who doesn't see you as a fellow, sees you as an intern, right? So they ask you to prioritize other things over your re research. Um, I had a situation where um, I think there was an imbalance in the perception of my position. Um, where I saw myself very much so as a, a full fellow, like as a research fellow, I was there to do my research and I was willing to take on other work and other projects on the side right, to help the research center kind of explore some of the areas that they were doing research. But the moment that that dragged on into, you know, well, you know, it, the, the moment we began to kind of encroach on why I was there and why I had received funding, um, I had to have a conversation um, and sometimes it wasn't easy. Um, but typically people were receptive um, and in situations where, um, you know, I couldn't help on a project in one, I had to walk away to get back to my research. Um, I tried to expand out the type of people I were working with. So um, I think by the time I left, I had an advisor at CSS who was fantastic and was working with me kind of on the, the politics and sensitivities around the topic I was working on. But then I had um, a professor who was doing a research scholar. So she was one of, she's, you know, PhD from University of California. Um, who kind of took me on and worked with me as well. And like, I learned a lot from her. So I kind of diversified the folks that I went to for guidance um, so that I didn't have to fully rely on one specific person. Um, and that was helpful when I kind of knew the lay of the land so that if, for example, I had an issue set that was, you know, these things do come up in research. I had an issue with one. Um, I could go to the other person and be like, hey, I'm having this other issue. I'd love your help figuring out how to navigate this. Or um, if I had a, you know, if there was a part of the research that could not get done in one area, having another mentor, having another advisor, um, or just someone who's willing to work with you on it, it's helpful Then you can go to that person and kind of, they can work with you on that part of the research. Because at the end of the day, the research is yours, right? You were there as a fellow funded by the US government to do what you proposed to do. Um, so you just have to prioritize that. And other people are going to try to put more work on top of you. And uh, when you get into these like research environments, um, but you really have the freedom to just say, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Um, and it's not impossible to switch research institutions or switch um, kind of sponsor institutions. Um, that has happened. And there have been situations I know for and after my year where the Fulbright Commission had to, you know, gracefully basically tell a, a, a sponsored institution, like, sorry, things didn't work out. Um, the fellow is actually going to be going elsewhere. 
Um, and it depends on the, of course, the, the Fulbright Commission in country, but um, I found them to be very helpful in navigating that to the extent um, that you can rely on Fulbright. It's a lot easier then because then an institution can't come back and be like, oh, Fulbright, they didn't do this. It's like, well, no, actually, you know, they came to us and told us what was happening. So they're kind of your end all be all at that end. So once you get their like stamp of approval, it doesn't matter what the institution says. Of course. Jesse, to kind of extrapolate that uh, experience and also apply to the English teaching assistantship uh, from your experience and, and, and colleagues that are friends that you've made who maybe have had that experience. Uh, have you heard from anyone who had maybe that type of conflict, but with their partner teacher that maybe didn't allow them to like, you know, in their application, it's like, I want to incorporate these methods, these ideas in the classroom. Did you did you hear of anyone who maybe met uh, some bumps in the road when it came to working with their partner teacher? I think in almost every situation. <laughs> I mean, I think that's something that's going to be inevitable is like, right, you're looking at, I don't want to say like autonomy or like sovereignty of the class, but right, it's a shared experience in, in a lot of levels. Um, in some cases, you might get brought on um, by a school to teach a specific, you know, class, and there's a specific time limit that you're supposed to be working per day, because you're also supposed to donate and designate some of your other time to a project as an ETA. Um, in some cases, schools might just overpile on you and you just get to the point you're at a breaking point. And again, in those situations, you can go to the school and you know try to wiggle out of it. But in most cases, it's just easier to go back to the Fulbright Commission, right? Because they're the ones who set up these partnerships and actually place the scholar. So if there is a if there's an issue, you go back to the commission that actually manages the relationship so that you have institutional support and backing if there needs to be additional steps, whether that is to move you to a different class or even to, to move to a different school, right? Because that can create potential challenges in the future. Like if the school keeps creating issues, and this is the same with research, if an institution or a partner institution keeps having issues or residual issues with scholars, you know, it might be an institutional structural thing. And sometimes Fulbright needs to go in and uh, the, the commission might need to go in and actually like revisit the relationship. Um, that's very rare, but I think it, it's helpful to have that institutional backing. Um, so like when I, first thing when I got to Jordan, like I fell up the committee, um, the Fulbright committee, they were the ones who were literally doing everything for us. So I was just like constantly gracious and just like, you guys are fantastic, thank you. Um, so it was easier and I trusted them and they built that kind of early rapport between scholars and the actual commission to, to act on our behalf and to trust us. And, and even in situations where students, you know, it, so let's say it was a fellow or a scholar issue, um, they were still flexible enough to work with the school to be like, okay, you know. Um, so I think, it, I think the, there's a lot of institutional experience in those environments where you just rely on the Fulbright Commission to, to intervene. And now we're coming up uh, on about 10 minutes left. And so still plenty of time for more questions. Um, and so please feel free to ask Jesse or we can uh, transition to uh, some final thoughts. Yeah, if no one asks me questions, I'm gonna start asking all questions. That's also fair. Uh, where do we have folks going? ETA research, where are you all applying? I'd be intrigued to hear. Awesome, okay, your way. I'm gonna start calling names of people, don't start. Italy, oh, awesome. Anyone yes. else? I would. Greece, uh, okay. Oh yeah. UK, awesome, okay, right on. All about master's degrees in the UK. Big fan. Yeah, how was your time at uh, Cambridge? Awesome. I loved every second of it. It was very unique. Great community. Um, yeah, it was great. Do we have any research folks? I think from the people in attendance, I'm, I'm recognizing a lot of ETA applicants and uh, awesome. I don't know if we have uh, as many as many research in attendance today, um, but this presentation ah. will be shared with uh, all of our students. 
Jesse, can I hop in? Because with my supplementary project, I do plan on doing some research on the side. Um, Awesome. Yeah, I'm also a doc student, so there's always just going to inevitably be research. But um, a lot of mine is policy based, so I'm also interested interested to hear your perspective as to how to integrate into some of these policy based spaces, um, particularly from my unique stance as an ETA. So to be interesting. Um, and that's one of the things I'm thinking about in terms of having my interview. How will I go about going from teaching in the schools to, hey, can I actually talk to your administrators? Um, mm. And so any thoughts or ideas towards that point? Oh, that's interesting. I think one, you're a PhD student. So I mean, right off the bat, you're, you're a researcher. So I think that plays in, um, and you're a PhD student with expertise in a specific area. So I think you can leverage that to your benefit, right? I think some of the issues you might run into if you're doing like, policy research within your institution that might be a bit harder um i would not really know how to navigate that like are you are you looking at doing specific research around like are you looking at doing research within the school that you're placed in or are you kind of looking more for okay perfect so that answers my question um i think honestly just find finding an institution on the ground that's doing something similar um or you might even be able to find institutions in the u.s that are doing or partnered with institutions on the ground there and you can go to that access point um, even before your interview, um, and you know, you can identify two or three partner organizations in the U.S. or one or two institutions on the ground there, and be like, you know, I plan on reaching out. Um, I had friends who were doing ETA that were actually doing really unique research on the side, um, and I think it's, you know, I, I think it's great. You know, you get the double trouble mentality where you're getting the, the research and class experience, and you're really getting that human interaction, helping to develop. Um, but at the same time, you're really getting to apply your PhD and kind of your research. I think, particularly on Fulbright, there's a lot of um, I would say, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a lot of emphasis and there's a lot of privilege that comes with the title, particularly in a lot of your host countries, because it's a position that is, is seen um, quite, there's a lot of weight behind it. So you can use the title to get in the door of a lot of places you might not be able to with other titles. Um, when I was in Jordan, I got, I got asked and invited to brief um, a few ambassadors on the policy issue that I was working on um, because it fell within the realm of, of kind of priority within those embassies. But because of the Fulbright, it was kind of like, oh yeah, we know exactly who you guys are. Like we know, you know, we have a bunch of students from our country who go to the US and like they're, they're like top tier. So um, you utilize that, utilize that as much as you can. I know that's helpful. I'm, again, I'm happy to also follow up if there's any like kind of specific strategizing you want to do on the policy front, I'm happy to help there. Jesse, could you, um, I guess in the final minutes that we have left, um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll ask one of the more cliche questions is, uh, what was the greatest takeaway from your Fulbright experience, um, either as it relates to your career or, or your graduate study or, you know, what came after? But if you, if you could narrow it down to one significant takeaway, what would that be? Oh, easy relationships. Um, research is great. All these things are great. Impact is great you're going to have a career full of that. Um, you really only need people at one point in your life. And you either choose to make them a part of your life for the rest of your life or you don't. Um, and I met some of the most incredible people. I was literally riding in DC the other day on an electric scooter and uh, someone was jogging past me. And like, I just heard with my headphones, someone scream my name and I like hit the side of the curb and like flew into the grass and I got up and it was someone from my cool breaker that I haven't seen in four or five years. And it was just this, because we've been abroad, it was just this immediate moment of like, oh my gosh. And we spent, we like had dinner together and, and hung out all night and just talked and caught up. Um, the, the people that you'll meet in your cohort, it's not always easy when you're in country, right? People that sometimes I, you know, you, you have abrasive relationships with, those can smooth out when you leave. Like you've got a year of surviving an experience like this with someone, it creates a sense of camaraderie. And even those situations where things might be tense in country <laughs> to stop you a year later from becoming best friends. Like I, it, and those people go on to do really incredible things, you know, whether they go into government, they go to law school, they become, you know, titans of industry or scholars uh, and specific STEM fields, professors. And that those it's, it's like a good steak. The older it gets, it's just like it tastes nice, right? Or the more. It, um, yeah. So there's there's I, I, the relationships really built everything for me. I, I can't rave enough about the experience just for that alone. I think Fulbright better uh, than most fellowships is is really robust in, in maintaining those uh, those connections, those professional uh, connections afterwards. And so 
there's actually a lot of local uh, and national chapters uh, within the Fulbright community to be a part of. And so this award has existed since the, the 1940s, uh, late, late 1940s. Um, so you're talking about like centuries, uh, like well, almost a century uh, of, of knowledge uh, that you have access to uh, and experience, you know, and so, and research that you have access to. So um, if you are selected as a Fulbright fellow, uh, please follow up with the Fulbright community and, and, and find that local chapter. They're really looking for more young alumni to engage after their experiences and to stay engaged with Fulbright. Um, yeah, and if I could add just briefly, the number yeah. of times, like after I left Jordan, I moved to the UK and then I moved to China both places and places I visited in between um, when I was in the Gulf for the Gulf era, like Arab Gulf for a little bit, like just shoot out an email, Google like Fulbright, click the country, shoot someone an email. Hey, I was a Fulbright in Jordan in 2017. I see where as well. Almost every time someone was like, let's get a coffee. Let's get a beer. Let's go hang out. Let's have a meal. Like the network is global, like truly global. Um, and then you can go to any country and see someone who you have no idea about their background or experience, but you share the Fulbright and that is enough. It's, it's a really incredible experience. Yeah, and I think this is an excellent example of that. And so, Jesse, thank you so much for sharing your time uh, and, and, and taking the time to share these perspectives with, with our current students. Um, you know, Jesse is one of the best examples of, uh, of our alumni network. And so if, if you have a very specific question about Jesse's experience or in Jordan, I'm sure he'd be more than happy to answer those at a later date, but we also can would love to put you in, uh, in connection um, with with alumni from our other fellowships and opportunities as well. And so, um, you know, sometimes these conversations, you know, they you don't know what they may lead to, but if anything, a good connection, you know, it's a great place to start. Um, but Jesse, thank you again uh, for, for taking the time. We really appreciate you being here. Of course, I just put my email in the chat. So feel free if you all have any questions in preparation or ways to think through specific questions that you anticipate you might get from the committee, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I'm in the process of moving, but um, I, I will, in my evenings, I'm happy to check and show you guys an email back. Perfect. But best of luck to all of you in attendance uh, that do have uh, your interviews in the upcoming weeks. You know, please feel free to uh, let Bonnie or myself know if you have any questions, we would love to answer those. But uh, again, Jesse, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Of course, it's a pleasure and a great to meet everyone and um, good luck. Bye everyone, thank you for joining today. Thank you, Jesse and Jesse.